Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. So this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Carl Hassan. He's an ARC Future Fellow. He's at uh, University of Newcastle in Australia. I thought there was Newcastle in England, but no. It's probably Newcastle's in the U.S. and all over the world, but in the Australia one. It's a good one. So yeah. <laughs> we're going to talk about his, uh, his research fellowship. Uh, he's looking at antimicrobial drug resistance, a uh, very important issue. So, Carl, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. If you would, tell me about your, uh, your work. Yep. Um, so I guess broadly, um, I'm interested in um, the origins and mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance in bacteria. Um, so primarily looking at um, hospital associated pathogens. Um, so these are the ones that cause opportunistic infections. So in vulnerable patients in hospitals. Um, so these bacteria have done a really good job of adapting to the hospital niche. Um, and we normally consider the hospital niche to be quite sterile because we use disinfectants and antiseptics to clean the surfaces. And then patients that are in hospitals are given uh, antibiotics to uh, prevent infections. Um, but these bacteria have developed um, resistance to a lot of the antibiotics that we use to prevent infections. Um, and they're able to tolerate some of the antimicrobials that we use to clean surfaces and to prevent their transfer between patients. Um, and so they've become resistant to those. Um, and because they've become resistant to those, um, they've become more of a problem and um, some of these bacteria have become superbugs. So we call them superbugs because they're resistant to multiple classes of different antibiotics. Um, and in, yeah, in, in, in the past, I guess we would have considered um, new drugs to be developed by big pharma companies, uh, but they've sort of withdrawn from that because of um, low profits. Um, and so that's meant that um, we don't have new drugs in the pipeline. And so what we're interested in is the ways that bacteria have become resistant to the, the, the compounds that we've got um, so that we can potentially tweak them or um, use them in different ways to, to kill these bacteria. Um, so yeah, there's lots of mine um, works for the uh, CDC and he was saying that, um, I guess the pee traps in sinks and toilets and things like that are places where, you know, the patient will urinate or stuff gets poured down the drain and then drugs will go down there, you know, either through body secretions or otherwise. And, you know, stuff sits there and festers and makes you know, a witch's brew of, of the most evil yeah. bacteria on earth. And then they, they get aspirated out of the drains and infect people. Is that a, yeah, a mechanism you've seen? Uh, well, I guess that's definitely a way that or an environment where bacteria could become um, resistant to antibiotics. Um, but it's kind of so we also use antibiotics in agriculture um, and elsewhere. And so where the origins of um, the, the resistance come from um, are quite complicated um, and how they find their way into hospitals. But, yes, yeah, certainly in those sorts of environments, it's um, when you've got multiple um, drug resistant bacteria together, um, they can exchange DNA um, and become more resistant um, to multiple different compounds and then if they find their way back up into patients then got problems um, so there's there's groups that are looking at um, those types of um, mechanisms and where so what's um, um so you're studying this particularly in hospitals uh so we study the bacteria that come from hospitals um but okay, yeah so, so what are some of the, the the worst ones that are the most resistant to to all drugs right now yeah so the ones that we're particularly interested in are the um the gram negative bacteria um, so these are things like Acinetobacter baumannii, um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, and Enterobacteraceae. Um, so these are a problem, um, particularly because they've got um, two membranes. Um, so that makes them extremely um, resistant or tolerant um, intrinsically to a lot of different compounds. Um, so they, the outer membrane that they have um, is covered with a, a dense layer of sugars, um, and it's very impermeable um, to most different um, classes of chemicals um, and so they're becoming more of a problem because into the future these are the um, the bacteria that are the hardest ones to develop new compounds for um, those uh if they have two membranes and the membrane outside is so hardened 
how do they transit, you know, plasmids or things through their two membranes? Wouldn't that yes. guess, so, yeah, uh, make got, it harder for them to do that? Yeah, they've got mechanisms for that. So for small molecules, they've got um, pores, and the pores are quite selective to the types of compounds that they want to bring into the cell. Um, so because of, like, the characteristics of the inside of the pore, they may only allow hydrophilic compounds to pass through, so things like metabolites, um, things that they want to have inside the cell, um, which makes it really hard to design um, an antibiotic that can pass through those pores um, to get entry in, in between the two membranes and then also have the characteristics needed to get across um, the inner membrane. Um, the inner membrane, and one of my big areas of interest is um, in efflux. Um, so the inner membrane also has quite a number of efflux pumps. So these are proteins that sit in that inner membrane and basically any compound that shouldn't be in the cell, um, they're able to recognize and, and to pump it out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Oh, to is, try there, is, there a, uh, yep. is there a space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane or is it so close and so tight that uh, nothing could reside in between the two? Yeah, no, there's, there's a space in there. Um, so in that area, there's, um, I guess, one of the major things that you find in there is a layer of um, what we call peptidoglycan, which is kind of like a mesh um, which protects the cell. Um, but, yeah, it's kind of a, a viscous environment with lots of proteins and small molecules. Um, but we do – there are some efflux pumps that span both the inner and outer membranes. Um, so they're able to move compounds – um, from within the periplasm or within the inner membrane across the outer membrane. Um, and because the outer membrane is so impermeable, it makes it really difficult for those compounds to get back inside the cell. So how do you know if a given bacteria is resistant to antibiotics? Like, you know, do you, in a dish, do you put some antibiotic with it and does it enter yeah. the cell and then gets pumped back out? Like, how do you know what's going on? Yeah, that's right. Um, so we can tell by doing simple um, resistance type tests um, whether or not they're resistant. Um, and then we've got different approaches that we use to try and understand why it is that they've become resistant. Um, so one of the, the simple things that we can do um, is comparative genomics. Um, so we can sequence the genomes of multiple different um, strains of the same species, um, which have different levels of resistance, and then compare um, the genes that they have um, to see uh, why it is that some of them have become resistant. Um, and we've got quite good databases now of um, genes that are known to be involved in resistance. Um, and so we can look for those types of sequences in the ones that are resistant um, compared to the ones that aren't resistant to get an idea about why they've become resistant. Um, but something that we're also interested in is um, intrinsic resistance. Um, so not... Um, not these resistance genes that are getting passed around or mutations that are acquired when bacteria are in hospitals, um, which make them resistant, um, but they're, they're core resistance mechanisms. So a good example is um, the outer membrane um, in gram-negative bacteria. Um, and to, to try and identify which of those intrinsic resistance mechanisms is involved in um, resistance to different compounds, we need to use different approaches. Um, and so for that, we use um, a lot of functional genomics. Um, so one example is transcriptomics. Um, so we can look at um, the expression of all the genes in the genome. Um, and bacteria are very efficient, so they don't want to express genes and waste their energy unless they, they need to. Um, so we can challenge bacteria with different antibiotics and see how they respond in terms of the genes that they're expressing. Um, and often what we'll see is that the ones that are involved in resistance um, that allow them to tolerate those compounds are uh, induced, um, or at least the transcripts are higher. Uh, in those cells. And so that points us in the direction of the genes that are involved in intrinsic resistance. Well, so um, how does resistance arise? The, the, the bacteria takes in the molecule and what it changes its, uh, its DNA or it changes its gene expression so that what it, it hardens its exterior, uh, yeah, so know, its exterior membrane or the pore selectivity changes or hey, how does it manifest? Yeah, so there are, there's different mechanisms for that. So what you're talking about is um, acquired resistance, so the development of resistance over time. Um, so one way is that bacteria can pass pieces of DNA between each other, um, and those pieces of um, DNA may encode for an enzyme um, or an efflux pump, um, which is able to confer resistance um, to a particular compound. Um, so the enzyme might degrade the compound 
um, when it's when it's expressed, um, and that confers resistance. Um, sometimes you see mutations appear in different parts of the genome. Um, so often at the the target site of an antibiotic. So antibiotics usually target um, things that are essential. Um, so um, the, the um, molecules involved in transcription, for example, um, or translation of sequences. And so we can see mutations appear at the sites um, of uh, the, the target sites of the antibiotics. Um, so that's, yeah, how acquired resistance works. Um, but yeah, bacteria, a lot of the efflux pumps um, and the genes involved in producing the outer membrane are intrinsic resistance mechanisms. Um, and so sometimes, yeah, when we see, um, when we challenge a bacteria with um, a compound, an antibiotic or an antimicrobial, we'll see induction of something um, quite novel um, that we've never seen before. Um, so in a study that we did um, five or six years ago now, we challenged um, Acinetobacter baumannii with a biocide called chlorhexidine. Um, so that is commonly used as an antiseptic in hospitals and it's uh, typically in soaps. So it's used to prevent the movement of bacteria between patients um, on the hands of um, the, the hospital staff. Um, and when we challenged Acinetobacter with that um, biocide, we found um, that there are only a few genes that were induced. Um, some of them encoded for an efflux pump, um, which we knew about, um, but there was another gene that was quite highly induced by that compound, which was um, completely unknown. So it was annotated as a hypothetical protein, um, which means it was a piece of DNA that looked like um, it encoded for a protein, but we had no idea what it did. Um, so we were quite interested in why that um, gene was induced um, by chlorhexidine. And so we went on um, to take it out of acinetobacter and put it into another bacteria that was susceptible. Um, and in there, we were able to show that it gave resistance to chlorhexidine. Um, so that was um, an example of identifying a completely novel um, intrinsic resistance determinant um, in, in how a How quickly a does this bacteria. happen when, uh, when a bacteria is challenged? How quickly does it uh, change itself up? Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess, yeah, I don't know if we, if we know the answer um, to that specifically. Um, you can, you can in the lab induce, so in the hospital it may be different, but in the lab you can induce um, resistance for some compounds, um, I guess with a few passages of, of um, the bacteria. So if you grow them on increasing concentrations of an antibiotic in the lab, after a few days you can have um, mutants that sort of break through and are resistant to that antibiotic. Yeah, so it's something that we um, would do if we were developing a new, a new compound, try and look at how quickly the bacteria can become resistant to it. But when you're, when you're challenging a bacteria, is it that bacteria itself that will change its gene expression, or does it, uh, are future generations of it the ones that change their gene expression? Like, you know, yeah, I guess how some, fast does it happen? Yeah, so in terms of changing gene expression, so some... The genes that are induced by the antibiotics are sort of part of an adaptive resistance response, I guess. So they're sort of tuned to be expressed in response to um, an antimicrobial. Um, but sometimes, yeah, you get a mutation that fixes um, a high level of gene expression, which confers a higher level of resistance. Um, and so there, I guess we assume that those mutations are typically spontaneous within a population. And so because you've got such a large population of bacteria, um, there's a good chance that these um, mutations just randomly pop up in the right spot. And then because you're challenging them with a high concentration of an antimicrobial, um, you kill off the ones or the ones that um, don't have that mutation are a lot less fit than the ones that do. And so the ones that have the mutation then grow up to become uh, the dominant um, type of cell in that population. Um, and so Is you anyone see, doing like sing single bacteria, you know, antibiotic challenging to look and see what happens? So at the single cell level? Yeah. Has anyone, um, has anyone looked at that? Yeah, people are doing things at the single cell level um, and looking at how like specific parts of the, the bacteria respond. Um, yeah, it's not sort of my field of, of expertise. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what are you discovering in particular then? What, uh, what kind of useful info are you finding? Yeah, so the, um, so the hypothetical protein um, that I mentioned, um, it was a new type of uh, resistance gene. Um, we then decided that um, to, to really understand how it works, we needed to get some insight into its function. Um, so we were able to uh, express and purify the protein 
um, and we could do experiments on it to test um, how it worked. So we could tell from its sequence um, that it encoded for a membrane protein, so a protein that sits in the bacterial membrane, um, and we could purify it from the membrane. Um, so we knew that it was a membrane protein for sure. Um, and then we could speculate because it was a membrane protein on its specific mechanism of activity. Yeah, so um, there's a number of different ways that a membrane protein could confer resistance um, to an antimicrobial. So it could um, change uh, the composition of lipids in the membrane, uh, which make it less permeable uh, to antimicrobials, or it could be a regulatory protein um, that um, signals to the inside of the cell to change expression of genes to make the cell more resistant. Um, or as I mentioned earlier, um, it could be uh, an efflux pump. Um, and so when we looked at the, the protein that we found, the gene that we found that was giving resistance to chlorhexidine, um, we then we, we tested to see if it was giving resistance to, to other antimicrobials. Um, so if it's an efflux pump, um, often we do see conferring resistance to other antimicrobials, um, but it seemed to be very specific to chlorhexidine. Um, so that, that um, was kind of unusual because chlorhexidine is a completely synthetic biocide. Um, and so it hasn't been seen in nature um, in, in like the, the long distant past, uh, but we could see that this protein was conserved um, among a lot of different bacteria. So uh, we knew that it had been in the genomes of these bacteria um, for a very long time. Um, so we did some studies to see if it interacted with chlorhexidine um, and we found that it could bind directly to chlorhexidine. Um, and so that was sort of consistent with it potentially being an efflux pump. Um, so we did some assays um, in bacterial cells and found that it could reduce the concentration of chlorhexidine in those bacterial cells. Um, and so that again was consistent with it being an efflux pump. Um, we also, we looked to see how, how broadly conserved it was. Um, and we found that it, um, there were homologs, so related sequences in a lot of other gram-negative bacteria. Um, and we went on to look at the, um, the functions of 40 or 50 of those um, and found that some of them also conferred resistance to chlorhexidine, uh, but some of them were giving resistance to more than just chlorhexidine, so other, other biocides. Um, and we could do different types of transport experiments to again show um, that they were able to lower the concentration of those compounds in bacterial cells, which was again consistent with them being efflux pumps. So um, through this, um, we discovered uh, basically it's a new family of um, multi-drug efflux pumps. It was quite exciting because we hadn't seen one of those for 15 years or so. Um, Is a, has anyone looked at literally an efflux pump structurally and you know, actuated it somehow, either using computing, computer modeling or yeah, something absolutely. to see how it functions? Yeah. What does that so, look like to you? What does that tell you? Yeah, so in bacteria now, there's um, six or seven families of efflux pumps. Um, and most of those we have um, like high resolution structures. Um, so most of them have come about through um, crystallography type studies. Um, some of them now are coming through high powered electron microscopy. Um, so it tells us that the, the different families do sort of function in different ways. So some of them um, sit just in the inner membrane of bacteria and they're able to transport substrates from in the cytoplasm into that space between the inner and outer membranes, which we call the periplasm. Um, and so they seem to sort of function typically um, in a fairly simplistic way. Um, so they have um, a centrally located binding site and substrates are able to bind into that binding site. Um, and then there's a conformational change, um, which is energized in different ways. So either by the movement of um, another molecule into the cell or by um, the hydrolysis of um, ATP. Um, and then it is then exposed to the, the periplasm and the, the substrate is released. Um, other than others, so there's a family um, called the RND superfamily, which is a particular problem in gram-negative bacteria because it gives really high levels of resistance to, to lots of different compounds. They function in a different way. So they're a, a, a much bigger, um, I guess, more complicated um, structure. Um, and they have like three sort of proteins that work together um, to capture substrates from the periplasm or the um, 
the, the inner membrane um, and sort of move them through um, the top of the protein um, and then through a channel across the outer membrane. Um, so those, those um, structures have given us a lot of insight into the ways that these proteins are able to recognize and interact with um, a very broad range of different compounds um, and to move them um, across um, the membranes out of the cell. Um, but for the family that we've identified, yeah, we don't, we don't have any structural information at the moment. So it's very difficult to sort of speculate on how it actually works to, to reduce concentrations of compounds in the cell. Um, so what's your, your end goal still, here? You know, let, let, so let's say you understand how the bacteria of your choice are, you know, are resisting chlorhexidine, for instance. Then what? Like, what's your end game here? Yeah, so I guess... Um, Sort of more broadly thinking about um, efflux and cell permeability, um, what we'd really like to do is to understand um, what types of compounds are able to come into the cell and stay in the cell and not be subject to efflux. Um, so if we can understand um, the specificity of all of the different efflux pumps, so it's interesting, bacteria um, typically have um, at least five or more different efflux systems which seem to have overlapping specificity when it comes to antimicrobials. Uh, but if we can understand the collective specificity of those different efflux pumps, um, as well as the, the, the types of compounds that are able to enter the cell, um, we can potentially identify um, the characteristics of what would be good future antimicrobials against gram negatives. Um, so I guess in terms of um, resistance, that's the end goal. Um, but yeah, we can use efflux for a lot more than just that. Um, so um, the, the family that I was describing earlier on, um, which gave resistance to chlorhexidine, um, we knew that chlorhexidine, because it is um, just a, a man-made biocide, has only been around for 100 years or so, that that protein um, probably had other functions. Um, so we thought that it would have been maintained in these genomes for millions or billions of years to transport chlorhexidine because it, it hasn't been around. Um, so we were really interested in looking at what its physiological function was. Um, and this is something that we see with a lot of efflux pumps. They don't just um, transport drugs. Um, they've got a range of other functions. Um, and that's partly because they can recognize um, so many different compounds. Um, so we went looking for um, its native substrate and we found that it was able to um, recognize and transport a class of compounds called um, diamines. Um, so these um, are found in all different cell types and they've got a, a whole range of different um, functions. Um, so in DNA and protein stability, uh, potentially in sig signaling, um, and they may also act as um, surfactants, which allow bacteria to move around. Um, so there are reasons why bacteria want to pump them out. Um, they become toxic at very high concentrations and they may also act in signaling and as surfactants so they need to be moved out of the cell um, and so we found these proteins were able to transport those out of the cell. Um, they're an interesting um, group of compounds because they've also got some um, commercial value um, so diamines are used for example in the production of nylon um, and at the moment we get the precursors for making nylon from petroleum um, but some of the other diamines, um, which are recognized by these efflux pumps, um, have different properties that we can use to make different nylons and that would also potentially make cleaner nylons because we're not using petroleum derived compounds. Um, so there's potential to use these types of proteins um, as well as the, the systems that, that regulate them um, in biotech um, to try and improve production of these types of compounds in bacteria. So that's another sort of end game, I guess, uh, when it comes to these, these discoveries. Do, do bacteria tend to alter antibiotics before they spit them out? Or do they just tend to uh, take them in and spit them out, you know, unchanged? Yeah, so I guess it, it depends on the antibiotic. So some of the enzymes that they produce are hydrolytic enzymes or um, modification enzymes. So these are, these are things that are typically passed around between bacteria, um, especially in these hospital bacteria. Um, and they themselves can give resistance um, because when um, degrade the antibiotic um, or modify it, it can no longer bind to its target site. And so the bacteria are no longer susceptible to them. Um, what happens to them after they're modified or degraded? Um, I guess we're not completely sure. Um, there are some bacteria that can use them um, as a carbon source, so they don't spit them out, they then use them to grow, uh, which is really um, scary because yeah, 
it shows that they're completely um, resistant to them. Well, what, what transits most easily into a gram negative bacteria? You know, is it plasmids from other gram negatives? And, and if so, why not try to package things inside of plasmids so that they can transit very easily into the bacteria and maybe, you yeah, know, okay. rise um, in a bad way? Yeah, so I guess they've got um, specialized mechanisms for, for taking up DNA, um, which a lot of research groups are actively studying. Um, some, yeah, some bacteria are able to take in foreign DNA um, a lot more readily than others. Um, DNA itself is probably, it would be challenging to, to package up um, a small molecule into a, into a strand of DNA, but there are groups that are working on um, delivery systems for antimicrobials with um, nanoparticles, um, which might work in a different way. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, targeting in that respect um, is a, a potential future approach. Um, yeah, it's not, not really my field, um, but yeah, delivery of those um, into a patient may be more challenging than a small meal potentially. Well, I thought plasmids were like extracellular vesicles in a way and they had their own membranes or they naked uh, pieces of DNA. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're naked pieces of DNA. Um, and often when um, plasmids are transferred between two bacterial cells, it's via a, a pilus, so a structure that moves the, the DNA specifically from one bacterial cell to another. Um, but some bacteria have um, what will um, natural competence, so they're able to just take up fragments of DNA from the environment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not um, encapsulated um, by anything. Um, there are, I mean, I guess, so some animal viruses um, are encapsulated. Um, there are viruses that target bacteria, um, but typically they're just um, a protein um, structure surrounding nucleic acid, which gets injected. Um, but there are potential future avenue of um, treatments. So using viruses that target bacteria against bacteria, um, something that has been, it was actively researched quite a lot. Um, in, in the past, um, particularly in um, the former Soviet states um, and something that's coming, coming back um, into, into fashion in terms of uh, potential treatment against bacteria um, in, it, with the lack of um, new antibiotics. Yeah, in the beginning, you said that there's not money in new antibiotics, but how could that be? If there's resistant you know, bacteria and it's killing people. Like, does no one care? Is yeah. there no money in there? Uh, so I guess it's just it comes down to the um, like the profits that um, big pharma companies would make. So um, antibiotics are different to other types of drugs because um, typically um, we don't take them continuously. So if you have an infection, um, you'll take a course of antibiotics. Hopefully that'll clear the infection. Um, if it doesn't, then maybe um, you'll take a course of different antibiotics. Um, so they don't get used as much as other compounds. Um, and if we do develop something that's, that's new, um, then the clinicians are less likely to prescribe it because they want to keep it in reserve so that the bacteria in hospitals and so on don't become resistant. Um, so I, companies could spend um, millions or billions of dollars um, developing a new compound and then not be able to sell much of it. Um, so I guess there's, there's issues in that respect. Um, and then by the time they start to make profits, um, the compounds come off patent. And so then they've invested a, a great deal of money um, for very tiny gain. So we can understand why pharmaceutical companies are less likely to pursue antibiotics, um, but it, it sort of pushed a lot of the discovery of new um, compounds to the academic level, um, to researchers at university. Yeah, that sounds like a broken system. Hmm. Yeah, so I think um, there's potential policy changes that could be put in place. And I think some, some countries are starting to do that type of thing um, so that things can be... Um, on patent for a longer period of time or um, yeah, um, fast tracked in terms of um, the, the trials that are, are needed um, when there's situations that um, people really need these compounds. Um, but it's something that people um, or researchers in academia need to keep in mind. Um, there's only so far that you can take the development of an antibiotic um, at a university level um, before it becomes too expensive. Um, so when uh, people are developing um, potential new antibiotics. Um, they need to keep in mind that in the future, this is something that needs to be taken on by a pharmaceutical company um, and made patentable um, by them um, if, if we want them to take them on and do the, the expensive clinical trials and so on.
Well, very good. What do you think is going to be possible with your research over the next couple of years? Anything that is close to a breakthrough or it's still a long ways? Um, so we are, we are still continuing to do those um, sort of functional genomic type assays. Um, and there are other hypothetical proteins that um, uh, my collaborators and I have identified um, which could potentially be other new classes of resistance determinants. Um, but ultimately, hopefully, um, at least for some of these bacteria, we can get a better idea about what types of compounds are able to, to penetrate into those cells and evade being effluxed by these many efflux systems. Um, and so those characteristics will um, potentially find their way into the next generation of um, antimicrobial. Well, very good. Well, Carl, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Um, so they can go to uh, my website, um, at the University of Newcastle um, and have a look. Um, so on there, we sort of keep an up-to-date um, list of our publications and research activities. Well, very good. Carl, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity, Richard. Yeah. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.